I think this is going to be everybody, which is awesome because it looks like it's a good amount of people that we can all get to know each other a little better. And unlike the like 70 something people in cohort one, I'm sure it's toned down some, but the first one was outrageous for so many people. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go around and have some introductions so we can get to know one another a little better. Uh, start with uh, your name, um, just so it, you, it's pronounced for everybody so they don't mispronounce it later. Um, and pronouns where you are currently located. Um, maybe a fun fact about yourself, could be R related, might not be R related. And what brings you to this particular group? What is your interest in tidy modeling or what do you hope to get out of the group? Um, so I'll start if I can even remember all those questions. Um, uh, I'm Stephen, and I am living in Milledgeville, Georgia. Well, near Milledgeville, Georgia. And my pronouns are he, him. And fun fact about myself, um, I'm building a garden, and that's a rain barrel for the catchment, water catchment system. And the reason I am here is I have an ongoing modeling project that I've been working on and I have been trying to pick up tidy models on the fly. And uh, it's been challenging to do so. And I feel like learning this along with a cohort of people will give me an opportunity to learn about and apply stuff practically in the project that I'm working on. So that's why I'm here. And whoever else wants to go next can hop on. I'm happy to go. Uh, so hi everyone. So I'm Luke, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm in Bristol in England. Um, I, don't I don't really have a fun fact. My name <laughs> I kind of had a fun fact thrust upon me recently in that there's a famous soccer player called Luke Shaw. So in England, most people open with that when they see my name. So I have lots, lots of discussions about Man United and stuff, which is all right. Um, and my interest in this group, so I've been coding in R for a while and really enjoy it. And in my new work, there's not a large cohort of R people. I've been really interested in seeing tidy models happen. So this is kind of trying out this format, which seems great, meeting new people and um, yeah, kind of getting, going through tidy models from the beginning, I think would be helpful as opposed to jumping in, which is what I usually do with packages. Awesome, nice to have you, Luke. I can go next. Um, my name's Kevin Kent. Uh, I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, US, um, uh, he, him, with pronouns. Um, uh, sorry, kids in the background. Um, and uh, well, so where am I? Uh, fun fact about myself, uh, I'm a big tennis fan and the Australian Open is starting, so I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm here because, uh, yeah, I love data science stuff and um, uh, I've kind of was taught a lot of the machine learning stuff in uh, Python, like with scikit-learn. And uh, that's like kind of what I fall back on uh, whenever I need that kind of thing. But I like R a lot more. Um, and I've been using tiny models, models a little bit in my work. And so I'm excited to kind of fully get into it now and uh, learn from all you. So. Cool. Thanks for coming, Kevin. Then I can go next. Uh, hello, everyone. Roberto here. Uh, pronouns he, him. Uh, I'm originally from Costa Rica, but right now I live in the UK, in Reading. Um, fun fact, uh, I used to brag that I was the top five, in the top five uh, Costa Rican Nordic skiers, uh, cross-country skiing, which I'm sure that's not true because, well, we don't have a snow in Costa Rica, so <laughs> I guess... <laughs> 
it's debatable. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I joined this cohort because I've been doing um, R for some time now, and that's mostly what I do at work. So not much modeling. So I would like to learn a little bit more and get into uh, modeling myself. But yeah. Nice to meet everyone. Awesome. Nice to, nice to have you. Um, yeah, well, I will hop on. So uh, my name is Carmen. I am from Mexico, but currently I'm living in Lisbon. And I've been coding like very recently, mostly because of the pandemic. And so as you said in the beginning, like I tried uh, doing data quest and that kind of uh, web page, but I find uh, better to use these books about I don't know, R in data science or this one for tidy models. So I'm eager to learn here. Like I'm actually maybe like a beginner level, but I'm I'm quite quite interested in this. Uh, for uh, uh, by the way, I'm a biologist and I'm doing a PhD, and I'm working with a huge amount of data because this uh, NGS thing. So that's also why I want to learn. Interesting. Nice to have you, Carmen. Okay, I may as well go. Um, my name is actually Graham, not August, uh, but August is the mocker I use online. Um, it's a reference to Augustus Comte and Karl Popper, who uh, famously had a debate about uh, positivism and um, objective um, uh, science, um, <laughs> which is nonsense, really. Uh, but like, you know, it's just a way of using a name online that I prefer not to use my own. Um, I go by he and him. And uh, I'm in Sheffield in the UK, next to the Peak District. Uh, I'm not really sure what a fun fact would be about myself. Um, I used to be a neuroscientist, um, and now I work in demand forecasting, so I do a lot of modeling. Um, but uh, that's primarily using uh, neural nets. But regardless of doing those on thousands of models, I need a better system for like just practicing, say, new features and stuff like that. And I think. Um, as Kevin mentioned, tidy models opens up a way to do that, like um, Eskit Learn, and I'd much rather have to do that in R rather than move on to Python. Okay, nice to have you, August. Sounds like you're going to have a lot for this group. Yeah, I can go next. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Mikhail. I'm originally from Indonesia. And currently, I'm living in Leiden, the Netherlands. So um, I go by he, he or him. And well, a fun fact about me is that my first name, Mikhail, is not derived from the, the angel Michael at all, but is actually from a uh, from a word in my in the language of my ethnic group uh, in Indonesia, which is uh, Mekel, and it's. It doesn't have a you know a translate translation to um, any language because it has nuances in the uh, ethnic language, but pretty much it means um, laughing. So it's not um, it doesn't have any relation with um, the angel Michael at all. And so like um, Car Carmen, I think I believe. So I'm also. Um, doing a lot of work with uh, next generation sequencing data, so gene expression data. But there, well, I use uh, mostly um, statistical modeling, not necessarily machine learning. So, well, I do know um, a thing or two about machine learning, um, use Carrot for a while, try to learn tidy models, but then I think it was out like for, um, only for a few months and there were like so many things changing. So I just stopped learning uh, that. And then, yeah, now I think that the package is getting more established and I'm so excited by the all the features in the recipes package, for example. And yeah, now I want to mm -hmm. learn more with um, all of you here. Awesome, great to have you. It looks like there's gonna be some interesting connections across people in the group already, so that's good. Yeah, so can I go on? So uh, my name is Shamsuddin and I'm from Nigeria. 
but I'm a graduate student currently living in Porto, Portugal, and I'm working on natural language processing. And why I'm doing this, I've been working with Python, but um, my uh, graduate supervisor, Melly worked in R and he forced me to also work with R. So it's good. Um, I mean, uh, I also work with Python, but uh, for him to understand some stuff, I need to do it in R. And uh, so I'm quite somehow bilingual. So that's why I'm here to learn more about R. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful to have you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Okay, I'll go next. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amelia. Oh, sorry. You want to go, Adam? <laughs> go, go. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm Emily. It's pronounced like in the movie. Um, if you've seen it, it starts it's starting to be old now. Um, I'm French, but I've been in the UK for 12 years now. Um, and my pronouns are she, they, and... Fun fact about me, I was once in stage for one song with Pink Martinis, a band in Birmingham, UK. And I'm here because I'm a behavioral scientist by training. I do academic research in psychology, but I'm also doing a MSc in data science right now to improve my coding and, and uh, data skills in general. And in my MSc, we're probably going to do modeling more towards Python this term. So I thought that would be a nice compliment. That's awesome. Thanks for coming. Sounds like you're going to be absorbing a lot over the next few weeks. OK. Uh, I'm Anna. I'm from Mexico. I'm friend of Carmen. And the fun fact probably is that we were just taking another a course in R and she told me, oh, I'm taking this one. Do you want to join? And I said, yes. So the, um, I'm here because I want to improve my, my programming skills. I currently, I'm a postdoc in Mexico and I work with imaging. So I want to learn as much as I want. As much that's, as I can. <laughs> that's awesome, thanks. Well, Thank uh, it sounds like some of us are already connected too, and there's a pretty large cohort in the UK, in Mexico, and uh, Portugal. We got people from all over the world. This is very cool, and we're all going to be learning together. Now, let me see, did we miss anyone? Has everyone had a chance? No. One more. Yeah. Layla. Hi. Um, so my name is Layla. Um, I, uh, she, her. I am currently right now in Georgia. I'm in Conyers, but I actually live in Miami. Um, so I, uh, fun fact about me is I consider myself a step above a wine enthusiast. So uh, I've actually taken courses and have a certifi certificate on wine. So if anyone wants to talk wine, let me know. Most likely we'll use what I gather from tidy models to play with wine data. Um, and why I'm here is because I work in academia, I work for the University of Miami. And uh, most of, uh, not most, all of my teamwork, teammates or colleagues are faculty. And so when it comes to doing the fun stuff, AKA modeling, I don't get to do any and I get FOMO and it pisses me off. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, do my own, try and um, uh, do my own work uh, outside of uh, the very nice and generous faculty I work with. And, uh, but unfortunately given my workload and uh, random other things that pop up. Um, I need to be held accountable. So here I am. Feel that for sure. Thank you for sharing. Welcome. Okay. And nobody has joined since then. All right, wonderful. Yeah, there is definitely some great 
wine data sets out there. And as we, people sign up for chapters, I posted it in there. Uh, feel free to use whatever data you want. If you find uh, some data that you are using more interesting than the data that the chapter is using, by all means, uh, use that to make examples for us. Um, I do wanna take a moment to say that if you do see John, John the Geek is his uh, alias in Slack. Um, thank him. He does a lot of behind the scenes work as well as Tan. To, uh, Tan runs the GitHub, John edits these videos. If you miss a session, uh, the sessions are recorded and I think they're actually gonna be posting them in line in the uh, R for DS tidy modeling with R uh, like example booklet. So you'll find that on the GitHub for R for DS, the tidy modeling with R, they're building a book down book. And so instead of individuals creating uh, individual like power, they're, they're not really PowerPoints, but the um, like Sheringen presentations, they're actually encouraging people to download the uh, cohort one book down and fill it out, elaborate it, add examples, and generally just improve upon what is in there such that uh, it's more accessible and understanding. And it sounds like we have a really bilingual group here. So if people want to write their sections in their native languages such that that information is available uh, in the tidy modeling with R, uh, R for DS GitHub, then that's, that's a great idea. So that being said, does anybody have any questions about what is going on? And did everybody get the, the chat message? Do those come up even after I sent it when people join? Is there a, is there a doc spreadsheet in there with the signups for everybody? Yeah. I do have a question about that though. So mm -hmm. um, is the expectation that um, all of us in this cohort will take one chapter, sign up for a chapter? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not expected, it's voluntary. So if you have the time and the volition to sign up, then please do so. And if you don't, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, somebody else will pick it up and do it. And Russian. can you elaborate on do it? <laughs> like what, is, yeah. what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, there is a GitHub for the R4DS. And in just a moment, I'll give a like short presentation for the first chapter. And I, I downloaded the, I, uh, what is it called? I forked the repository and just built on top of what cohort one uh, provided. And I just added examples, provided stuff to clarify statements that I felt weren't well elaborated enough. And I'll present that in a moment. And so that's generally what you will do if you decide to sign up. Uh, is you can fork that repo and kind of build out examples and um, build off of what is in the TMWR book and what is in the GitHub repo to create a demonstration for everybody that you feel will enhance their ability to absorb the material well. So let's okay. do it. <laughs> okay. um, and then so if... So if I were to sign up for one and fork the repo, make some modifications, do I, so I'll do, is it like standard where I will, you know, submit a pull request to the original one and see, like, I don't, I don't know who moderates it. And if this, if what I fork includes any modifications from cohorts two, three, and four, because I think this is cohort five, um, I'm not sure. This is cohort two, actually, for TMWR, for the tidy modeling with R. Sorry, I'm thinking about advanced R. That's another one I'm going to sign up for. <laughs> Sorry, guys. 
Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're on five or six now uh, yeah. with Advanced Star. Um, yeah, Advanced Star, for folks who have done um, some of the other, who, who are maybe new to the R-verse, that's another book by the uh, Tidyverse team. Um, and there's ongoing cohorts. If you are interested in that, you can sign up on the channel associated with the name uh, Advanced Star. And that is more uh, like Sheringan presentations that people create for each chapter. Uh, whereas with here, they're trying something different and creating a book down and, and encouraging people to enhance the material with each subsequent cohort. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thanks. Okay, cool. And yeah, the, the GitHub is posted in the chat. And uh, as far as what to do when you have finished it, uh, yes, you'll just make a pull request back to the uh, TMWR r 4 ds book club. And Tan and John are the moderators and they'll approve it, assuming it all checks out or they'll ask you to you know, change something, I guess. I've never had them do that, so I don't know. Uh, but I would assume that that's what they will do if there is something that they think needs clarity or whatnot. Any other questions? How's, um, I'm, I assume this meeting time is good for people moving forward. Uh, if there are any people who know they're gonna be gone for a long segment, um, I guess the videos will be there for you. That also being said, uh, reminds me that if you do sign up for a chapter and life happens and you are not able to present that week, as soon as you are aware that there might be an issue with being able to present that week, just uh, send a message in the channel. And we I'll, I'll try to figure out what everybody's handles are in Slack so and put everybody in one thread so we can know what each other's handles are so we can message the group more easily. And I might talk to John about like how to do that best. Um, just let people know and uh, we'll somebody else will try to jump on it last minute or we'll just use the previous week's material and go through that because that can also work. So yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, so, our, so it seems like the first cohort and what we did in Advanced Star is we signed up on the on the GitHub README page. Are we doing the, the signups on uh, the Google Doc instead, or, or both? Um, I didn't see a place to sign up on the GitHub. Maybe I'm missing something, but I didn't see anywhere to do that on the TMWR uh, book club thing. So I'd say we just use the sheet for now. Uh, yeah, I think that's easier. Uh, it just like, if you go to that first, like it says meeting schedule on there and then they have all these chapters like in dates um, and then there's a name next to like the ones that have a sign up. But oh, God, I was just okay. curious that that's what we were doing in like the advanced R group. And uh, I don't know, I think it's easier if you don't have to do a pull request to like sign up uh, and all that, so. So, yeah, plus anyway, I, I don't was just, really know. Yeah. Yeah. I d yeah, I don't really know how we do it with having two cohorts simultaneously. It might get a little, uh, looking at this now, it would get, it looks like it might get really un unruly with like multiple cohorts going. So, uh, yeah, that's a good point, though. Um, the obviously the names on there, if you look at the meeting schedule, that is, that's not us. Um, so the, sheet there and I'll post that sheet in the channel right after this is over and try to tag everybody so everybody has it and maybe we can get John to put it in the like channel thing unless you're able to do that Kevin are you able to stick stuff in the channel description in the sorry in the slack channel description yeah. oh like pin, like pin things or uh, I'm not sure uh, I, I don't, I don't yeah, yeah pin or in the channel description yeah if you could add like our, the link to that in there or pin it yeah, do you know john might be better doing that kind of thing okay uh, i'm not sure i I'll, i can check after okay cool 
Okay, yeah, so hopefully that, that stuff will be easily accessible from the Slack channel moving forward. Um, okay, so any, any other questions while I get my computer connected here? Okay, well, awesome. And if any questions or you have something to contribute when I'm going through the presentation or you're like, that's not right, you should fix that. Don't hesitate to speak up and let me know. Um, it's definitely meant to be a space where we are sharing ideas and actively collaborating. Sorry about that. Probably should have connected this beforehand, but I didn't. So, I have a question. Um, yeah. Do we have a, a specific kind of length of time that we're aiming for in terms of how long each session is? Uh, ideally, each session goes right, somewhere around an hour or under an hour. That's what it's typically mm -hmm. been. The amount of content in the chapters uh, I haven't read all the way through this. I've only read to like chapter three in this book. There might be stuff in chapters that take us a little longer, but I think we're aiming for around an hour. Thanks. Good question. Yeah, good question. And we can also, if a chapter seems particularly dense and it seems like an hour is not enough time to do it we can always spread it out over two weeks and just handle it that way um the speaking of which the if we get, if we manage to make it uh one chapter a week the appendix would be done on may 16th the last chapter on may 9th so that is approximately how long uh, your Sundays will <laughs> have this in the middle or end or beginning of it. Uh, so you can plan accordingly. Okay. It looks like my computer is finally connected. Can y'all still hear me? Cool. screen I am not sure they might have actually put my pull request to the repo already. There is also a GitHub web editor for the, if you're um, not familiar with doing book down in R, there's a web editor so you can edit the book more directly and create your pull request directly to the GitHub if that's something you're interested in doing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you'll probably notice as well that he adds the chat log from cohort one now, I guess, to the ends of the R4DS. Um, GitHub, so you can see what people, what questions people have and whatnot, and use that as material as to what to cover or as inspiration for what you add to the subsequent week of the book down. I just realized he's doing that, John being him. And I have the slowest R session ever. You'll, if I do any live demos, you will uh, 
get to see how incredibly slow my computer is. I'm waiting for it to load the book down right now. Okay, cool. Okay, screen should be visible. Looks like it is. Cool. Okay, so the first chapter is pretty introductory, high level view of modeling in general. And um, courtesy of John, we have some helpful learning objectives as to what the book is about and what you can expect to get out of it. So first one being recognizing the principles uh, that are foundational to how the tidy models package was designed. Learn how to classify models as descriptive, inferential, and or predictive. And in doing so, you'll have definitions for descriptive, inferential, and predictive models. Differentiating between supervised and unsupervised regression and classification, and an easy one, quantitative and qualitative data. Um, understanding the roles that data can have in analysis and apply the data science process and recognize the distinct phases of modeling. So here's some quotes from the chapter. The utility of a model hinges on its ability to be reductive. The primary influences in the data can be captured mathematically in a useful way, such as in a relationship that can be expressed as an equation. There are two reasons that models permeate our lives today. An abundance of software exists to create models and it has become easier to record data and make it accessible. I'd say models are silently influencing us in so many ways today, whether we recognize it or not. So learning how models are created and how we can create them ourselves definitely gives us some insight into how the world is working today. So Tidy Models was, this book was created to help us fall into the pit of success in stark contrast to a summit, a peak or a journey across the desert to find victory through many trials and surprises. We want our customers to simply fall into winning practices by using our platform and frameworks. Uh, this means that it is created to avoid confusion and to avoid mistakes. And so Tidy Models is really made with a balance of creating rails such that it's easy to stay on them and do the right thing in your modeling process without having to apply a lot of cognitive load to it and to be flexible to allow you to do uh, uncommon things with your modeling process. And we'll see how that is the case as we move forward. So the different types of models, there are descriptive models that describe or illustrate characteristics of data. There are inferential models that make a statement of truth regarding a predefined conjecture or an idea. They usually produce some kind of probabilistic output, such as a p-value, a confidence interval, or a posterior probability. It sounds like there's a number of people who are using statistical modeling of this nature already. So these terms should be familiar. And if something is not familiar and the explanation that I'm giving is not adequate, please don't hesitate to just speak over me. And uh, so I know that there's a question and we can attend to it. Um, <clears throat> usually delay feedback between the inference and the actual result. <clears throat> so that's meaning like hypothesis formation and then, you know, testing, doing the actual analysis to determine the result. Predictive models produce the most accurate possible prediction for new data. Uh, trying to estimate how much rather than inferring will it. 
There are mechanistic models. These are derived from first principles to produce a model equation that is dependent on assumptions. Uh, they depend on the assumptions that define the model equations. And unlike inferential models, it is easy to make data-driven statements about how well the model performs based on how well it predicts the existing data. There are a number of biologists here. So a good example of this that might be relatable is mechanistic models of the heart, blood, atrial pressure, and volume of blood that the heart pumps. Those are well-defined uh, based on you know, characteristics that can be measured. And they're, they tend to be mechanistic uh, because there's a lot of similarity between the way different hearts pump blood. So empirically driven models have more vague assumptions. They're derived directly from the data. Uh, there are no theoretical or probabilistic assumptions that are made about the equations or the variables. Um, and I want to like qualify that because there are like ge sometimes general assumptions of like the particular modeling process that you use. Um, this is more meaning like their theoretical and probabilistic assumptions that aren't already made about the type of data that you're uh, looking at. The primary method of evaluating the appropriateness of the model is to assess its accuracy using existing data. Uh, there's some footnotes there if you want to explore uh, these distinctions in more depth. Okay, terminology. Unsupervised models are used to understand the relationships between variables or sets of variables without an explicit relationship between variables and an outcome. Examples of this are PCA clustering and autoencoders. I don't know if this is a good example, but one of the um, examples of this that maybe some of you have encountered is if you've ever run ads on a social media platform like Facebook, there are often like clusters of user types that you can pick to run ads to or anybody in advertising clustering is often used on large data sets in an unsupervised way to understand like affinity groups within a particular like set of consumer preferences. So supervised models have an outcome variable. Uh, examples are linear regression or neural networks. It's very clear what you are trying to predict. And the nature of what you're trying to predict might be numeric, in which case it would be a regression model, or it might be a qualitative, ranked, or just categorical piece of data, and that would be a classification model. Um, yeah, quantitative data numbers, very straightforward. Qualitative, nominal, data, non-numbers. Uh, what might not be so straightforward about these is thinking about how data is best represented. Um, sometimes that is where it helps to have good understanding of quantitative and qualitative to know what kind of data to record about a given phenomena, because we often like phenomena in the world aren't natural, some aren't naturally quantitative or qualitative, and we have to um, use our best guess to understand how to represent it such that we can draw conclusions about it. Um, so data can have different roles in analyses, outcomes, labels, endpoints, dependent variables, value being predicted in supervised models, um, and predictors. Independent variables, variables used to predict the outcome. And independent variables there is, uh, is said with a grain of salt because some models assume variables are independent and other models 
don't assume that. Uh, they take into account dependency between predictors. Or try to, at least. <clears throat> okay, so the data analysis process, uh, cleaning, which I'm sure many people are familiar with here, always the most fun of any of the parts. Uh, making sure the project goals are accurate and appropriate is a part of that, uh, which is often comes to social and um, kind of like, what is it called? Emotional intelligence or like business acumen, asking the right questions and determining like what data is appropriate and how that data needs to appear in terms of its veracity and also volume, like how much of it is needed uh, to really make accurate conclusions about it after a modeling process. Uh, and involved in that is understanding the data, having uh, some knowledge depth or consulting somebody who has depth in the field uh, to understand uh, where the data come from, what they mean, and is it is the data relevant? Uh, these are always good questions to ask. Sometimes it's easy to get myopic when we have a data set presented to us or we have a server that we're just going to go and, you know, pull data off of and try to answer a question. And it's important to be able to ask questions about that data and is it the appropriate data to, to answer the questions that are being asked. Um, Develop clear expectations of the goal of your model and how the performance will be judged. Uh, and this often involves, you know, consulting stakeholders and having a clear idea of what the a successful model would look like. What is the performance metrics or realistic goals that can be achieved? And here's the data science process figure here: transform, visualize, model. There's also, I'm not presented there, but coming between model and transform, I think would be evaluate, uh, which is often what makes that process cyclical, is we transform data, we visualize it, we model it, and then we evaluate the, the accuracy of the model. And that can either lead to communication or it can lead to starting over again and uh, coming in with a different set of assumptions or better data to better uh, model the data and have a more accurate, you know, evaluation. Okay. So modeling process, EDA or exploratory data analysis uh, often involves visualization or assessing skew or other things like that, where you are using kind of simplistic models or qualitative characteristics or quantitative characteristics of the data itself to understand it, to get a better idea of what models are appropriate or how to proceed. Um, feature engineering is using the data to construct um, features that might have greater explanatory value than the raw data itself. Uh, and these, if they're done properly, should lead to greater accuracy in your, um, in your model. Uh, these are, you know, often derived mathematically or by binning or um, transforming particular features of the data, raw data. And then model evaluate, or sorry, model tuning and selection generating a variety of models and comparing performance. Uh, some models require hyperparameter tuning. Uh, in the case of machine learning models, uh, the type of types of questions that are being asked and the nature of the data being either extremely large or extremely complex doesn't allow us, in some cases, to have really good intuitions about what types of parameters would be appropriate for fitting a model. And so we fall back on 
computational power to run through many, many, many different combinations of parameters to hone in on the parameters that are most appropriate to accurately represent that um, or to accurately model with the given type of model one is using. Um, model evaluation. Uh, we use EDA-like analyses on residuals or whatnot and compare model performance metrics to choose the best model for the situation. Um, the carrot confusion matrix, uh, which I heard carrot mentioned earlier, carrot was the predecessor to tiny models, but the con carrot confusion matrix was a really excellent tool for model evaluation. And uh, it exists in a new form in tidy models. And so that might, from there, it might lead on to communicating or presenting results of the model or deploying the model as it may be, or it might lead back to EDA or initial feature engineering, or even back to data collection if that is what is necessary. Steven, I have a question. Yeah. Um, well, I have two kind of. Um, so this might be a little bit premature, but for feature engineering, um, maybe you might know. So you mentioned that it's a good idea. To, it's a step prior to your initial model to uh, probably select features that might enhance your accuracy of your model. But if you are doing um, maybe something like uh, unsupervised or so, let's say some kind of clustering or PCA, for example, where you don't necessarily know you want to find clusters, is that still something that's re relevant or useful? Uh, PCA and clustering are often used as feature engineering techniques, actually. So okay. um, often, yeah, that you don't really think yeah i don't i don't know if somebody else may be able to answer this better um but i think typically pca and clustering the unsupervised approaches are going to not need feature engineering and are rather going to be used as feature engineering things i don't know if anybody else can speak on that with more I would use, um, I would pick out features that I didn't think were relevant because you can sometimes get, say, correlation between uh, features and it also increases computation time. So um, when you want to um, do something like a clustering analysis or a PCA, sometimes the best thing to do is to work out which things are useful and which things aren't, which you already have. Then you do something like, so it's talking about um, doing iterative processing on this. So then once you've worked out what you think is useful or not, you might create, say, a cluster using a particular technique, and then you'll find out whether that's relevant or not. Um, so you have to go through this process of uh, creating features and work out whether they're useful. But typically speaking, you only go through the cluster analysis part once. But as for the feature selection engineering part, you definitely need to go through a process of making sure if you've got a lot of features, you probably remove some of them and you want to make sure if they're useful or not. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. Computational time is definitely something that needs to be taken into account, especially with large data sets. Um, also, while, while you're mentioning that, I think one, maybe one feature engineering technique that would happen prior to something like PCA or whatnot is also looking at correlation. If they're like highly correlated uh, variables, it might not be necessary to include all of those, and they might give you, you know, artifacts and overemphasize things um, just based on, you know, the, the columns of data that you decided to pull out of the server. So it's good to check on correlation as well uh, to eliminate highly, highly correlated uh, variables. Okay. I want to add something to that, and you can. And you can also use PCA, for example, as a feature engineering before clustering. So um, there are, I think there are a lot of data where you have a lot of variables and 
uh, PCA can out, can also be used to actually reduce the number of variables to maybe uh, 50 or something uh, principal components. And um, PCA can also be used to um, sort of group your variables so that the correlated variables uh, can be captured with a one or a two several principal components. So there are a lot of use uh, for PCA in a, as a feature engineering part. Okay, okay, that's really helpful. I'm uh, just for warning. I'll probably be asking a lot of questions that are very that are kind of specific, just because I am, like I said, like I'm going to be uh, trying to take lead on uh, some analyses, and one my first data set is actually. Uh, a survey of women with breast cancer. And then I have no idea how to start, but, but except for trying to find uh, any kind of patterns within these women. So like any kind of principal components um, that I, like characteristics that are similar between them. So anyways, that's just a little bit of background. So um, my second question actually was, so in the format of um, presenting, um, is it expected to have the book down version? So like what Stephen just did, if we go ahead and fork the repo and make our modifications and um, have our pre preparation material and then go over it, or is it kind of up in the air? Um. I would say that the the request of John and Tan is more just like a suggestion. I think they would love to have everybody um, augmenting the tidy models with our r for ds book down. And I think that whatever, and this is to everybody, whatever you feel is the medium that you feel is going to be best able to uh, explain interesting and relevant um, information from the chapter, uh, or if it's a you know mode of presenting that feels familiar to you, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, don't limit your creativity because of the medium that is suggested to you. I would say use whatever medium feels best to you, and whatever data and like you know kind of feel depth that you have because as at least personally, it's already super interesting to hear people's expertise drawing from their own fields and having this cross-disciplinary um, uh, data exchange here. So definitely don't feel limited to just using the book down. Use whatever you want. Cool, 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 cool. All right, thank you. Yeah. Great questions, great questions. The, um... This discussion on feature engineering got me thinking. I'm I'm not sure it belongs here, so to speak, but had me thinking around like the the human element of like, does it make sense to include these features, and then also whether it's ethical or not to include them. So I don't know if we're going to cover that or how we'll involve that, but it feels like modeling and data science and all this has is a very it's a kind of a marriage of whether whether you should be doing something and whether it's computer, no, whether the software allows it, I guess. Um, feels kind of relevant so to awesome. feature engineering, like, yeah, I don't know. I'm really glad you said that. I hadn't even thought about that, but I'm looking at the chapters and I'm like, that is conspicuously missing from the chapters here. And I would really appreciate if there is an ongoing thread of the ethics of modeling and you know what is appropriate to be uh, pulling into data sets and how or how not is appropriate to model certain types of data. So I think that's a really great addition. And I, I really hope that we have some, some interesting, you know, topical information from different people's expertise fields as to you know, how they grapple with questions of ethics in modeling and in um, data science. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. I actually second this and I welcome anybody um, that wants to collaborate um, 
because I am actually in the in the study that I, I previously mentioned. Um, I'm making a point not to just throw in. Um, I, I don't know for, for a lot of you that it seems like a lot. There's a lot of like biological health uh, oriented people, but um, uh, I've always grappled with uh, journals that are often just throw race as a variable in their models um, and get. Uh, you always get the same results, which is, you know, at least here in the United States, uh, it's you, the final conclusion is always like being black puts you at risk at being black, it was significant at a p value of, et cetera. It's like the same uh, redundant things, but it's actually a proxy of multi a multitude of um, environmental, unless you're biologically pre predisposed to a condition, it's actually a multitude of, of structural factors. And, um, structural and environmental. And so I, uh, in this particular study, I'm, I'm making an effort, a conscious effort to be careful on, on this, though I'm not, like, this is a learning work in progress. I don't know how to deal with, um, I don't know how to, how to be the most, uh, the least biased and most ethical in modeling because also I'm still new to modeling. So um, I welcome anyone that wants to collaborate. Yeah, well, being aware of it, as aware of it as you are, I think is, you know, leaps and bounds in the right direction. That's for sure. And um, yeah, I think that's also brings up a really good point about how we, not only how we model and how, what data we draw on and where that data comes from, but also how we discuss it and how we present it and what, how we understand the implications thereof of how it's presented and when and why it's presented. Those are all great, great things to be aware of for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering, can we like supplement the book or like, you know, read a paper together or something or, um... You know, if we feel like we all want to have a topic on ethics, you know, one week. Um. That sounds like a great idea. Um, yeah, I invite you to modify the schedule or maybe maybe send out a uh, like a win to meet or something like that, a doodle or something and see if people want to put in a, a day somewhere in there to have just like an ethics day and discuss that specifically, add that into our, our chapters as we go along. I think that'd be a, a great idea, especially even earlier on such that it becomes a, a thread as we move throughout the book, because it'd be good to have that as a, you know, on a side as we discuss the different topics. Yeah, that sounds good. I guess it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because obviously this, this book isn't, like, yeah, whether it's missing or not, like this book isn't telling you everything about everything. It's specifically about tiny modeling. So I don't know if it is necessarily bad that it's missed it out, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool for us to, to think about it. Um, or I'd, I'd be very interested, yeah. Yeah, and honestly, I think um, Tan and John would probably welcome that if we, if we wanted to even add a section on the R4DS version of it they'd probably be down with that. And who knows, Max Max and Julia Silge might also be, <laughs> be like, oh yeah, we should totally do a chapter on this. So we'll see. I, I know that uh, these first two cohorts, um, part of the tidy modeling with our, what we're doing right now uh, was invited by uh, Max Kuhn and Julia Silge to get feedback on the book and what they can add and improve. So they are kind of following along. You might even notice when you ask questions in the TMWR channel, they're paying attention and will sometimes answer questions. So uh, it's definitely a, a place where, you know, there's a lot to be explored. Cool. Did anybody else have any questions? Who is who is talking about like where do we put the put put a potential chapter? Was that Kevin or was that Luke? 
Uh, for signups, or sorry. Yeah, for or no, for figuring out if we want to read a paper or a primer on ethics, like where we would put that. Was that you, Ken? Oh, I just suggested that. Yeah, that 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 be something to consider. Uh, do you want to take point on uh, putting together like some kind of way of figuring out where where we would put that, or you want me to do that? Uh, sure. In terms of like the sequence of weeks and stuff. Um, yeah, just we can we can put it at, on any particular day at this time. We just need to figure out which one works best. Okay, um, maybe after I don't know. Maybe it makes sense after chapter three, like before the basics uh, stuff. That sounds. I don't know if that, that works. Right. For, I have, I have feel about that. Possibly after FE. What's FE? Oh, yeah, for geoengineering. engineering. Uh, I just wanted to type first. Uh, so maybe after six? Yeah, so we have potentially after three, potentially after six, or possibly both. What do people think? I think it's best just after six, because six is about feature engineering. And when you talk about ethics, you typically talk about what you bring into a model. Um, so, so if you talk about features, then once you've talked about the features, you then caveat that afterwards as to what it is that goes in, because that's what reminds you is the part just before the modeling. Okay. Does anybody, is anybody um, opposed to having it around, like before or after six, before six or after six? What were you saying? What did you guys think? Was it, but were you saying before six or after six? I think it was uh, Graham and me after, saying after. After six? Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think I can do the poll thing. If anybody, let's just have a show of hands. If people think after six, just hit that little like hand thing or hit one of the things that, you know, shows the little thing pop up on your camera. And I'll try to pay attention. Seems like to okay. It seems like most people are, are down with that. Okay, so I'll, I'll just uh, the spreadsheet accordingly. We'll have a data thing, uh, a data ethics day there. And if people have papers that they want to recommend or suggest, uh, as soon as I get a thread or whatever up in the slack with all of us in it we can uh you know throw that stuff in there and figure out which ones we're gonna read and be ready to discuss for that particular week yeah i think it should also that's a good spot for it as well because we'll already have some talking about the aims housing data um which i think is uh you know we'll also prime some discussion on that topic This is going to be a great group. I don't know about y'all, but it certainly feels like this is going to be a really interesting group. A lot of diverse perspectives. Oh, one thing I was just thinking um, might be a good idea because some of us um, may not be familiar with like Bookdown as to um, a link to how to adapt Bookdown or, um, for instance, you know, the presentations that we use for the other club um, because it's not. As straightforward as using, say, PowerPoint. Good point. Okay, I will uh, make a note. I'm going to just make a note about all the things to add to the thread here. Um, and let's see, where is my thing? I'm going to stop sharing screen. Don't really need to have my screen shared anymore. How do I try? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So, Ethics Day, papers for Ethics Day. Um, tutorials on Book Down, Schrengen, 
spreadsheet. Okay. All right. Does everybody feel ready to go out there and model? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, this chapter is really like not super substantive, but it definitely, I think, created some, some good discussion. And next week is a tidyverse primer. Uh, so for folks who aren't familiar with the tidyverse, that'll be a nice introduction to kind of the syntactical nuances of the way the tidyverse works, which fortunately for our coders, you know, tidyverse is very cognitively simple. It's very easy to understand tidyverse code. And that's one of the things that makes it so popular. It's quick to absorb and understand what it's doing. Um, let's see, do we have anybody? Yes, Kevin, awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. And is there any other questions, ideas, Serge, things you want to say, laugh? Anybody got any jokes? I don't know. <laughs> No jokes, but just but just say yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, agree with you. Soon. Should be good. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, it looks like people are putting some notes here. Okay, they're just letting us know that. All right. Yeah, I see everybody's in the sheet. So um, we'll gradually fill these out, and I encourage. I think it's if if you have something you feel like oh I'm kind of drawn to that but it feels too hard, that's probably a good one to do because you'll learn it far better by trying to figure out how to learn it and present it uh, than um, just reading it. It's definitely a really nice learning opportunity to figure out how to make it absorbable for others. Yeah. And you can ask questions as a presenter too, so <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to know everything. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in on Sunday. Excited to explore this material with y'all. I think it's gonna be really insightful and um, educational exploring this with y'all for sure. Thanks. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Go play in the snow if you've got snow. Otherwise, have a good day. Thanks, Steven. Hey, Pretty good. Thanks, Steven. See you, everyone. Hey, you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. Bye. Bye.